Welcome to Prophecy Countdown with author and pastor Kenneth Baer. Join us every week for the latest updates on what the Bible has to say about the events, the characters, and prophetic signs of the return of Jesus Christ and His coming kingdom. Make sure you not only subscribe, but like your favorite episodes and share it with your friends. Now, on with the broadcast. Welcome. The title of my teaching today is The Prophet's Offense. Welcome to Prophecy Countdown. I'm Pastor Ken. We provide two updates each week. Uh, one at Sunday that premieres at 1 p.m. The other one is on Wednesday that premieres at 11 o'clock. Um, our updates are prophecy related. Um, and the way we get our topics, by the way, although lately it's been mainly in Israel because of all of the, uh, the war uh, between Israel and Hamas, actually against all uh, Islamic uh, radicals, uh, we've been talking a lot about Israel, uh, but if if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, that's how we get a lot of our topics. Uh, just send us an email to prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. That's prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, so again, today my message is actually from Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 through 58. This will be the end of the chapter 13. And I've titled my message, The Prophet's Offense. Let me read to you beginning in verse 53. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brother James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know, this, this account of Jesus' departure from Judea uh, and traveling to his home, home country is in Matthew chapter 13 that we just read. It's also in uh, Mark chapter 6. In this chapter 13 of Matthew, and this goes to our context, uh, as this chapter comes to an end, Jesus has been teaching in parables. If you remember going back to the beginning of the chapter, he told the parable of the sower, but then we had the parable of the mustard seed, the leaven, the wheat and the tares, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price. And then finally, the parable of the dragnet. Uh, we spent some time last week talking about the parable of the dragnet. It's a, it's a remarkable look, actually, into the last days when Jesus returns and the angels come and they separate the wicked from the righteous. You know, we often don't think this way, but Jesus was a, was a prophet. He was the Messiah, he was the Son of God, but he spoke parables, and many of these parables were prophecy as well. Um, this, this parable, for example, of the parable of the dragon, it talks about the angelic actions related, related to the future um, at the end times when Jesus returns. Now, Jesus had been teaching as well as healing primarily in the region of Galilee. And here in verse 53, Jesus is traveling. He's departing from there and traveling a relatively short distance to what Matthew says is his own country. It uh, says exactly the same in chapter 6, his own country. Now, scholars are quick to tell us that this means that Jesus is, is traveling to Nazareth. Nazareth is often considered Jesus' hometown, and it's mentioned in the gospel accounts as a place where Jesus grew up. After all, Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, so when it says Jesus went to his own country, his own hometown, that means he's traveling back to Nazareth. So this is an account of Jesus, the Messiah, who is also a prophet of God returning to his home. And Jesus makes a very interesting statement that I want to dig into for a minute. Jesus says this. He says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own home. Now, the same quote can be found in Mark as well. Mark chapter 6, verse 4. Almost exactly the same words. Jesus said, uh, and a little bit more simply, about a year previous to that, when he was in Nazareth as well, if you remember the account, uh, Jesus is, uh, goes to Nazareth and it's a Sabbath day. 
And on the Sabbath day, he's in a synagogue, and they hand him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he opens it up to where uh, what we know as Isaiah chapter 61. It, it's a well-known messianic prophecy, and Jesus reads it and applies it to himself and to his ministry. Now, you have to remember the people in Nazareth, as well as all the people in Galilee and, and Judea, were all hoping and praying for the time of the Messiah. They were hoping that they would be honored to be able to be uh, there when the Messiah returns. Uh, but for many, they thought it couldn't possibly just be a carpenter's son. Jesus quotes Isaiah, and this is what he reads. He says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to build up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all those who mourn. Now, while some marveled, most of the others <laughs> were incensed. They were so angry, the Bible says, that they were filled with wrath, and they wanted to throw him off the hill. Well, Jesus said this before they tried to throw him off the hill. They say, he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. You see, many scholars chalk this up to the situation, uh, to what's called familiarity. Uh, the people are familiar with Jesus. They saw him grow up. You know, they remark, where did this man get his wisdom? All these mighty works. Isn't this not the carpenter's son? And, you know, and then they, they name Mary and Joseph and his brothers and sisters. Um, they're so familiar with him that it was too much of a leap of faith to look at Jesus as a prophet, and let alone to see him as the Messiah despite what they've heard and seen and the miracles that Jesus had done and performed, these were all signs of, of divinity, all hallmarks of the Messiah, and they were offended. They took offense. The passage ends with these words. The people say, where then did this man get all these things? And so they were offended at him. Again, there was offense of the prophet. Now, whether you know it or not, uh, there are many that take offense today, uh, just like the people in the hometown took offense at Jesus. And, and what is it that offends them? The truth. Was Jesus the Messiah? Well, certainly, Jesus had all of the attributes, all of the prophecies that were being fulfilled by Jesus' first coming. He was born in Bethlehem, that's Micah chapter 5. He would be born of a virgin, that was Isaiah 7, 14. Um, he would be built, born of the tribe of Judah. He would spend some time in Egypt. He would be called a Nazarene, that's also from Isaiah chapter 11. He would be rejected by his own people, and he would speak in parables. You know, the Psalm, Psalm 78 says that he would speak in parables. This is Jesus, the Messiah. And of course, most of the people in Jerusalem were offended by Jesus. They were all offended. So, so offended were the religious leaders that they crucified Jesus because of the offense. And that offense, my friends, continues today. Christians are mocked and ridiculed because of their belief in Jesus and their belief in what the Bible has to say about the basics, creation, salvation, heaven, hell, how we should live, holiness. The Apostle Peter tells us this particularly will happen in the latter days, and it will be those in the church that will be offended. Let me read what Peter has to say, and then I'll explain my last comment. Peter tells us this is in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and, they have, and the earth standing out of water and in water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition. You know, Peter addresses a common thread of skepticism, of unbelief, of scoffing, all related to clear Bible prophecy and also what the Bible has to say about the creation of the universe, 
the flood, which was a judgment, as well as the coming end times, which will be another time of judgment. Old Testament as well as New Testament prophecy, including the teachings of Jesus, is what's being mocked. The skepticism and mockery is because of the familiarity that people have and it's not familiarity with the Bible in general or prophecy in particular, but familiarity with the status quo. You see, that's why people mock, because they're too used to what's going on today. You know, people are born, we grow up, we can choose to have faith, we can embrace Jesus or decide not to, but ultimately we all die and people say nice things about us at our funerals. You think I'm kidding? <laughs> that's exactly what people know. That's what they're familiar with. But there is coming a time, and the Bible tells us very, very clearly, that there will be a time of judgment, a time of tribulation, of darkness, of severe trials, greater than any time in history. And the Bible tells us that there will be a generation, get this, a generation that will see all of this coming. And there will be a generation that not only sees it coming, that, but this generation will never die. Will never die. The, the Bible says that this generation instead will be changed in a twinkling of an eye with the shout of an angel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise up and meet those that have died in the air to be with the Lord. This is a promise that the Bible makes. This is called, by the way, the rapture of the church. But this word rapture, just the word rapture in, the, in many Christian circles is, is an offense. Why? Well, because the people are so familiar with the past 2,000 years of the church. We're born. We grow up. Some have faith. Some don't. But we all die. And the people say nice things at a funeral. This is what they're familiar with. Uh, by the way, as I mentioned, who is doing the mocking that Peter refers to? Well, it's the people in the church. Who are the people that are the scoffers that come in the last day uh, that saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. These people are in the church. And how can I say that? Well, first of all, this is what we see. The people that are mocking the the teachers that hold up the, the word of God and say, thus saith the Lord, are being mocked, especially those that talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And, and that's first. And secondly, we know that atheists really don't care. They don't care. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in a second coming. They know nothing about it. And then take some of the religions, like the Buddhists. The Buddhists don't even know that 25% of our Bible is prophecy. They don't know that there's three times as many uh, pro uh, prophecies about the second coming of Jesus as the first. Um, they don't know about the book of Revelation that speaks about the future of the people of Israel in the last days. It's the church. It's the church, my friend, many in the church that are doing the mocking. You know, so much of the church is not pre or post. They're what I call pan. Not pre, not post, but pan. And what they say is it'll all pan out in the end times. It'll all pan out. Uh, don't bother to listen to these prophecy teachers. Uh, don't worry about the second com coming of Jesus Christ. We really don't know what the Bible has to say. It's, uh, it'll all pan out. Well, my friends, that is the talk of the mocker. That's the talk of exactly who Peter prophesied would be coming in the last days. These are the words of the person that is so comfortable with the familiar that they are unwilling to see the signs. And there are so many signs. My goodness, Israel's in the land. That's sign number one. Um, the, the earth is full of violence. That's the sign of Noah. That's sign number two. And I like this one. Jesus said, this good news will, about the kingdom will be preached through a, all the world as a witness to all people, and then, and then the end will come. That's Matthew chapter 24. My friends, the signs are all around us. Don't be a mocker. Jesus is coming, and as I said last week, look up. Let me pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to reach so many people by video and by audio, these podcasts. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us. We thank you, Lord, for the teaching that we have in the Bible about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is to bring comfort to us. The Apostle Paul said it is the blessed hope.
So, Lord, we thank you for that. Bless the people in our listening audience, and we give you all the praise. Be with the people in Israel through this difficult time. In Jesus' name, amen. Nearly every day, it's common to see, read, or hear something about the end of the world, the apocalypse, or end times. Author and pastor Kenneth Baer's The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom zooms in and breaks down biblical prophecy as it relates to Jesus' imminent return and the coming seven-year period, including the Great Tribulation. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Get your copy on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble and select Christian bookstores. The title again is The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom. You can also find it listed by author Kenneth Baer. Get your copy today.